powering place. It's a hidden gem, isn't it? Um, and um, to think that the, you know the, that people have sat where you sat and I, people have stood where I stood for 350 years and more. Here's Cromwell speaking in July 1653. Incidentally, you are you are getting this evening the new authorised edition of Cromwell's words. In some cases, you're the first people outside the editorial team who will hear these new uh, and improved versions of his words. Here he is in July 1653. In my pilgrimage and in some exercises I have had abroad, I did read that scripture often, 41st of Isaiah 19 where God gave me and some of my fellows encouragement as to what he would do there and elsewhere, which he hath performed for us. He said, he would plant in the wilderness the cedar, the shittar tree, and the myrtle and the oil tree. And he would set in the desert the fir tree and the pine tree and the box tree together. For what end will the Lord do this? that they may see and understand together that the hand of the Lord hath done this, and the Holy One of Israel hath created it, that he hath wrought all the salvations and deliverances we have received, for what end? To see and know and understand together that he hath done and wrought all this for the good of the whole flock. Therefore I beseech you, so he's speaking to Parliament, I should have said, therefore I beseech you, though I think I need not, have a care of the whole flock, love the sheep, love the lambs, love all, tender all, cherish and countenance all, in all things that are good. And if the poorest Christian, the most mistaken Christian, shall desire to love, live peaceably and quietly under you, I say, if any shall desire but to lead a life in godliness and honesty, let him be protected. Um, I don't think those can be the words of a counting hypocrite, uh, but there were many of his contemporaries who saw him as a counting hypocrite. And historians, particularly in the last 50 years, have been very reluctant to challenge the view that he might be a Christian who made errors of judgment, but he was a deeply sincere Christian. And I'm just going to go back to, to basics and say, how can we be absolutely sure of that? I think there is an authenticity about words such as the ones I've just read, which are, you know, totally persuasive for me. I don't think, I don't think they could, um, I mean, if, if, is he a psychopath who manipulates others? Well, we have to find other ways of demonstrating it, but those words themselves powerfully affect me, and I hope they have some effect on you. B because to start any kind of unravelling of his um, Christian faith, we have to admit that uh, from the time that he moved from obscurity in the area around Huntingdon and St. Ives and Ely, when he moved from there into public, into public gaze, we can never, ever place him in a church, by which I mean a chapel like this as well as a, a, as a traditional parish church. There would have been evidence of it if he'd been there, there were family weddings in royal chapels, though we can't actually say he attended them. It's likely, but we don't know. Uh, we can't ever place him at the funeral, even of his close friends. And he didn't have a funeral himself. His body was drawn in a great, in a great public procession from Whitehall to Westminster Abbey, and he was buried in a vault inside Westminster Abbey. But there was no service of any kind over his body. And that must be, I think, by his instruction. So there are puzzles to start with. We can place him at prayer meetings. We can see him uh, with fellow soldiers in what is effectively a Quaker-like meeting of silence and then dealing with some major issue confronting the nation. And then anyone, a common soldier, a junior officer, a senior officer, would start to break a text and would suggest that a text 
from the Old Testament or from, certainly from the Pauline epistles applied to the situation they were in. And the most uh, famous example of that, which we know he was present at, though we don't know if he spoke, um, the most famous example of that um, is when they're considering whether to execute the king. And, the and a number of people spoke, and, it, and what they said died. No nobody picked it up. And then, from the book of Numbers, one of the soldiers talked about uh, the man of blood, the man who'd shed the innocent blood of God's people against God, whom God would have judgment. But God would have judgment through human agency. God's normal way was not to use thunderbolts, but to move people to be his agents. Had the time come, said the member of the army, had the time come for the army to acknowledge that it was called by God, it was called by God to strike down Charles I as a man of blood. And a turning point, a Rubicon was crossed. And others spoke to it, and so on. So he certainly took part in religious meetings, but he never seems to have gone to church. We have a, a partial exception here. A German um, ambassador who was trying to get a favour out of the English Commonwealth because what his master wanted was extremely unpopular internationally. So he thought the English um, government of the early 1650s, which needed allies, might help him. I mean, he's twiddling his thumbs, waiting for Parliament to agree to meet him. And he uh, writes this in his diary, um, in Latin. Uh, in the King's Chapel at Whitehall, General Cromwell sat today with his family in the same pew which was formerly occupied, sorry, formerly used by the King and his children. Colonel Hugh Peter armed in a sword, dressed in military regalia, preached, and this is common. Anyone may step up when he wishes and delivers a sermon. So here in the Royal Chapel, Chapel Royal, we have one glimpse, the only glimpse, but, it's a, but it, is, it is of, a, of um, a soldier choosing to come forward to talk in biblical terms about the times. We can, we, we can go through his, uh, all his works and find that he didn't um, read very much at all. Uh, one of the obituary notices on him says that he read men rather than books. And the books that he knows are the books of the Bible. And I'll talk about this a bit later on. He certainly doesn't feel any need, as, many, as most of the Puritans do, including the occupants of this pulpit. Um, he didn't think any need to read Bible commentaries. There's no evidence at all, there's no sign of Bible commentary in his words. Uh, there's no sign that he read any, any systematic theology. He didn't read the great theologians, the Puritan tradition. He simply engaged with the Bible. He might appear straightforwardly to be Calvinist, though actually I can find extremely limited evidence that he was influenced by the fundamental, central teaching of Calvinism on uh, double predestination. And his, his, his words and his letters and his speeches constantly move between seeing the people of England as the people of God and then seeing a people of God amongst the people of England. He's very unstable in that I don't think it's particularly load-bearing. He doesn't have a very strong sense um, of the end of time. He thinks God is working in human history and in our own times, or he claims to believe this, in order to create, as it were, the same kind of change, which was what when Moses led the people of Israel out of Egypt, through the, the, the Red Sea, across the desert, into a promised land. But it was a, it was a this worldly promised land. It was a new, it was in fact, it was, it was in fact a new Jerusalem. But it wasn't the end of time. It wasn't the second coming. So again, occupants of this pulpit would have been much more drawn towards saying, are we in the last times? Are we on the edge of promises and prophecies? And I don't see that in Cromwell. So there are important respects in which 
we can't simply portray him as a typical Puritan. He is a typical Puritan in having a very strong sense of divine providence, that's to say of, of God's immediate action in the affairs of man, of God not being an observer but a participant. There's, a, there's one of his soldiers who writes that he could testify that in battle, when a parliamentarian fired his musket, the bullet was bent so that it hit the body of a cavalier. When the cavaliers fired their muskets, God caused the bullets to curve past them. And that's the level of intensity of, of the way God could intervene in the, in the very small as well as in the big picture, in the meta-narrative. And he uses the word providence a great deal to mean God's demonstration of his will for his people um, by his intervention. So here he is in 16... Um, well, this is, this is 1653 as well. I won't be, no, I won't be, I'm trying to spread myself right across his life. But here's another 1653 one. Let me remind you of the series of providences wherein God hath appeared in dispensing wonderful things to these nations from the beginning of our troubles um, until this very day. If I should look backwards, I should show in, in what state this nation stood in and the hostile actions between the king and parliament. But I need not being more fit for uh, history than a discourse. That, after diverse turnings of affairs about the midst of the, this war, it pleased God to winnow the forces of this nation and to put them into the hands of men of better principles, but to show how it was brought to pass would spend much time. Um, there were many appearances of God, um, very remarkable. Um, that notion of winnowing, of course, reminds us of Gideon. And Gideon, who took the force of Israel and made them drink. And those who put their heads in the water were sent home in disgrace. And those who scooped water and kept vigilant were kept. And with that godly remnant, God uh, overthrew the, the host of Midian. And Gideon was a, was a man called from the plough to lead the armies and then retired uh, full of honour to his farm. And Cromwell, for a period, models himself on Gideon. He is the man who had winnowed the English armies, created the godly army, the new model army. And he saw himself as Gideon and he yearned, having won his victories, to return to his civilian life. But God would, not, would have more of him. And so increasingly he sees himself not as a new Gideon, but as a new Moses, leading the people of England out of captivity in Egypt from slavery under the House of Stuart, through the Red Sea, regicide, into a desert. So the fact that things were not easy after the regicide didn't trouble Cromwell, because the people of Israel had to learn obedience to God before they recognised that they were called to cross the Jordan and enter the Promised Land. Moses wasn't allowed to go with them. He died. And I think Cromwell increasingly recognised that would happen to him. But he also knew that God always called you, but he never determined. So the people of England had a choice. They could learn obedience to God and enter the promised land. Or they could be, get worse in their disobedience and trek back to Egypt. Which is exactly what happened, of course. They trekked back into Egypt and a new pharaoh in Charles II. Cromwell links the word providence to the word necessity. He says to his hand-picked nominated assembly in 1653, the one that he chooses the 140 godliest people he knows, and says, you sort out the future. How can we have a democratic system when we're still full of doubters, of men of low faith? How can we create a true representative system of government in this broken desert world. He says that power has come to these 140 by way of necessity, by the wise providence of God. So providence is God's guidance. Necessity is recognising God's call. It's doing, recognising what God wants and falling in, because that is, that is the easy thing. If you swim against the tide, 
you'll get nowhere. And here he is in 1657, when many people are trying to make him king, saying, look, the, the simplest thing which will, which, will, which will make things much easier all round is if you became king. And he agonizes over whether this could be God's will. And he finally decides it's not God's will. God had destroyed monarchy. Only God could restore it. He waited for a sign. Would there be a providential sign? And he couldn't see it. I hinted to you the other day, I do not contend for any name or anything for myself. The Lord is my witness in this matter. I, in all things, wait under the disposition of the providence of God. This name I now have. I took not of that Lord Protector. This name I now have, Lord Protector, I took not upon me as hoping to do any great good, but having a desire to prevent evil. I should also think any name better than mine, or any person fitter than I am to manage any such business. I should think when you are settling the peace of this nation, the main thing that has the consistency with it should be pursued, and I should be willing to serve therein, though not as a king, but as a constable to, set, to keep the peace of the nation. And he goes on to say that the providence of God hath laid aside the title of king de facto. He says, I, I will not pick up that which providence hath destroyed and laid in the dust. I will not build Jericho again. So, you know, the walls of Jericho had come tumbling down because God had sent a message that the, the trumpet blast, the walls of Jericho would fall. God had caused the walls to fall down. Of course, the people had to blow the trumpets. But you could only rebuild those walls if you got a similar command, and there wasn't a similar command, so he couldn't do it. So already we're getting a sense that not only does he have this strong one-to-one -one relationship with God, but that one-to-one -one relationship, the speaking of God to him, is through scripture. He has no sense of sacrament, no sense at all of communion with God in Holy Communion. Even in a Calvinist, well, Calvinists have a very strong sense, very strong sense that for the elect, for the elect, through the action of the Holy Spirit, uh, the elect receive the body of Christ and blood of Christ. He has no sense of that at all. But he does have a sense of the power of God's word to transform us. So here he is talking to his cousin, a very prominent lawyer, Oliver St. John, in 1647. This scripture hath much stay to me. Read it. Isaiah 8, verses 10, 11, 14. Read the whole chapter. And the relevant bit of, St. And of, of, of um, Isaiah in uh, King, King James Version, which is the one Cromwell used, um, is this. Take counsel together, and it shall come to naught. Speak the word, and it shall not stand, for God is with us. For the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand, and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of his people. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence to both the house of Israel from the Lord of hosts, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. He, Isaiah here is predicting that the wickedness of the people, their disobedience to God, is going to cause a terrible, a terrible uh, defeat on them. They're going to be enslaved and taken off to Babylon. And he's going on to say in Isaiah here that a godly remnant will survive the terrible suffering of the defeat at the hands of the Babylonians. So he's feeling that we've been through that process now, but a godly remnant has survived and will rebuild God's kingdom. Those who have been kept purity in, in evil times. I'm going to come back at the very end to look at um, the most con controversial, well, you might say the most controversial thing Nick Cromwell ever did was execute Charles I, but of course he was only one of many who'd reached that collective decision. But his personal decision, the one which is obviously the one which has most damaged his 
reputation um, for, for 300 years um, is the massacres of Drogheda and Wexford. Um, one of the most courageous things I ever did was talk about the Drogheda massacre in Drogheda. Um, and I'm going to talk about, about that. And is he a good, can he be a good Christian if he can justify the massacre of 3,500 people, a, a significant number of them in cold blood? And we'll come back to that. The, uh, during the English Civil Wars, the nearest thing there was to a massacre in, in cold blood was the sacking of Basinghouse in Hampshire which was a Catholic stronghold, the Marquis of Winchester, and all the defenders were Catholics, and they, they refused, he summons them, I'll say he, he, he offered them terms, they refused them, he summons them and said, if you do not surrender, your lives are at my mercy. And then when they didn't surrender, he did kill, uh, somewhere between hot and cold blood. As I say, he stormed in and killed people whether or not they were bearing arms. Uh, Hugh Peter, the man who uh, preached with his sword by his side in 1650, Hugh Peter report, recorded at the time that Cromwell spent the whole night of the 13th and 14th of October 1645 before the sack. So he spent the whole night, the eve of his storm and massacre, um, meditating on Psalm 115 with its exaltation in the destruction of idols because it was the idolatry of the Catholic garrison and their reliance on their, um, on, on their, image, uh, their images of the Blessed Virgin Mary and so on, uh, that he meditated on that in order to see was it God's will that he should carry through the destruction of the garrison. But the problem remains. There isn't a single one of his contemporaries who left their, recorded their memories of him. There's not a single one who believes he was a sincere Christian. Now, the royalists, you might think, fine. Presbyterians, um, we'll come back to. Fellow soldiers who fell out with him. The sects, the levellers, the diggers, the Quakers, all say he's a counting hypocrite. It's a problem. It's a problem historians consistently put under the carpet. You already see that I don't believe it. I think he, I've, been, I've been beguiled by him. As, of course, many of his contemporaries were. We need to come back at the end as to why everybody said that he was what I don't think he was. It's a problem. Uh, because of time, I'm not going to quote them all. The, 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 one of the things you do need to say is they're totally, totally split amongst themselves over whether or not he is, a, I mean, they don't use that word, but whether he is a... Um, um, a sociopath, a manipulative personality from throughout, or whether he was a truly good Christian man who was corrupted by power. And if he's corrupted by power, these people who knew him well gave the dating of his corruption completely differently from one another. So that itself is an important qualifier. People who knew him well were all over the place about, and I should say foreign ambassadors also join that chorus of, of people who don't take him seriously. So we need to come back to that. We know that he wasn't brought up as a godly man. We know that his family wasn't particularly godly, and almost all his extended family on his father's side uh, were royalists and, and Anglicans. His father doesn't appear to have had any particular strong religious faith. He was conventionally Anglican. Um, he was educated by someone whose theology is clearly Lutheran rather than Calvinist, and with whom Cromwell later fell out. Um, when his first child is born, he invites um, an old college friend to be the godfather. This is the first letter of his that survived. 
very little known. It's a man called um, Henry Downhall. He is what you'd call a high Anglican fellow of St. John's College. And he writes to him and says, Loving sir, make me so much your servant by being godfather unto my child. I would myself have come over to you, but I have more, um, but, um, to, to have more, made more, a more formal invitation, but my occasions would not permit, and therefore hold me in that excuse. The day of your trouble is Thursday next. Let me entreat your company on Wednesday. This is, this is not religious language. This is a very, this is, this is, I see it all the time in ministry. This is, you know, how our child being baptised comes to the party. So something happens to him after 1626. Now, I think it happens to him in 1629. I think he goes through a kind of total breakdown. Uh, he is financially in deep trouble. Um, he's expelled from the council in Huntingdon. And um, he, and very unwisely, uh, slanders the mayor and the recorder, the legal officer of the town. They report him to the government. He's made by the government to make a humiliating apology on market day with everybody jeering at him. So his credit has gone. And he feels constrained to sell up in Huntingdon and to be cut move to being a working farmer in St Ives renting a farm and it's at that point that a London doctor reports um, that Mr Cromwell of Huntingdon was treated by him for Valde Melancholicus clinical depression and it's at that moment I think that he has this sense of his complete worthlessness, the complete failure of his life and that is the moment in which God calls him and says I'm going to save you despite, not because of who you are other historians, there's a very, very good historian who's written a biography of Cromwell who was maintained recently, supported by one of my former pupils, and well, well, lots of pupils, so I suppose some of them are bound to disagree with me, but, <clears throat> but who thinks that Cromwell got into trouble in the mid-1630s because he was desperate to get his hands on the estates of his mother's brother, who was childless. So he was the next of kin, but he'd fallen out with his uncle, and there were some suggestions his uncle was about to disinherit him. So he went to court and got his uncle declared a lunatic. And because his uncle was declared a lunatic, Cromwell gets possession of his, of his estate, and the uncle duly dies. See? Now, they claim this is what, this was, it was this that made him feel completely worthless. I mean, he, you know, he behaved in this shabby way for reasons of material greed. Well, it could be, but I don't, I don't for a minute believe it. I don't believe it because we have good reason to, and I'll, if you want to ask me questions about this after, we have good reason to accept a report by um, someone called Richard Timms, uh, who says, who testifies that it was his, it was the hap, it was my hap, it was my, my um, usual purpose, to be at a conventicle, um, as I rode every Sunday to the Isle of Ely for that purpose, having a brother who entertained me in this course, where he heard the same Oliver Cromwell with such admiration that he thought there was not such a precious man in the nation. Cromwell preaching at an underground church, a radical banned underground church in St Ives, in 1635, before the business of his uncle, but after the nervous breakdown in 1629. Now, this is a letter he wrote in 1638 to a female cousin who's just had a disastrous marriage. She's married way above her, and she's pregnant on her wedding day. She's been acting, I'm pretty certain, as a governess to the widowed... Um, the widowed lawyer. I think she lost the baby. Well, she did lose the baby. She lost the baby, and I think she's now trapped in a loveless marriage that only took place because of the um, pregnancy. And now she's trapped in a marriage way out of her league with a husband who's going to be vindictive to her because uh, you know, he's trapped with someone way below his social status. 
and no doubt blaming her for the pregnancy. And this is what he writes. Oh, well, I'll just, I'll, sorry, I gloss it. I haven't got time. I'll, I'll gloss it. Um, Cromwell is 39 in 1638. He's writing to an 18 year old, uh, married to a rising star of the legal profession. And he launches into a classic conversion narrative explaining how, although he had been a chief, the chief of sinners, that's 1 Timothy, God had called him out of darkness despite his unworthiness, not because he had earned any special merit by his way of life. As a result, he said, my soul is now, my soul is with the congregation of the firstborn. Firstborn Jesus Christ, congregation of the firstborn, the elect. So I am now amongst the elect. This has all the hallmarks of a letter of encouragement to one who seems to have confided that she was in a dry, barren wilderness where no water is, Psalm 63. And it's a letter saturated in biblical language. In a letter of about 800 words, there are 13 different allusions or paraphrases from five different psalms, three New Testament epistles, the second book of Samuel, and three separate allusions to the Gospel of John. None of them is developed, each resonating into a cavernous silence of the soul. It's hardly likely that he adopted this rhetorical strategy to impress his young cousin. He's surely seeking to root his own experience and perpetual experience of the people of God, to universalize his experience of the power of God's grace, to batter its way into stubborn hearts. At the center is the assertion of although he has been a chief, the chief of sinners, he who hath begun a war, work, he, sorry, he who hath begun a good work in me would perfect it in the day of Christ. That's Philippians. Most striking is the assertion, all the bolder because it's not a direct allusion to scripture, that Cromwell, by Cromwell, if here I might honour my God, either by doing or by suffering, I will be most glad. Here he is, a working farmer, going down, socially downhill, suffering from chronic bronchitis, writing to a, to a, um, a cousin out of her depth. He's suffering. But I think when his chance comes to serve his God, not by suffering, but by doing, when the chance comes, when he unexpectedly becomes an MP in 1640, the poorest man in the long parliament, reported by a royalist as being the man who was notable for having spots of blood on his lace collar, what do we learn from that? He hasn't got a spare lace collar, and he can't afford a barber, because barbers don't cut you. So Cromwell's the poorest man in Parliament, and this is where he ponders what, has God, what is God's purpose? Is it to make him witness by suffering or by doing? And when he gets the chance to do, he does. I just don't believe that that is a, that is a sociopath. I just simply do not believe that there could be anything insincere in this letter to this suffering 18-year-old. Well, what about this? to his brother-in-law, Valentine Walton, after Marston Moore. He's got a hundred things to do after winning the great victory of Marston Moore. This is what he writes to Valentine Walton. It's our duty to sympathise in all mercies, that we may praise the Lord together in chastisements or trials, so that we may suffer together. And he describes the great victory that God has given them at Marston Moore. We must give glory, all the glory to God. Sir, God hath taken away your eldest son by a cannon shot. It break his leg. We necessitated to cut it off whereof he died. Sir, you know my trials this way. His son had died of camp fever the previous year. But the Lord supported me in this. The Lord took him into the happiness we all pant, pant after and live for. There is your precious child full of glory, to no sin nor sorrow any more. He was a gallant young man, exceeding gracious. God give you this his comfort. Before his death he was so full of he was so full of comfort 
but to Frank Russell and myself, he could not express it. It was so great above his pain. Truly, he was exceedingly beloved in the army of all that knew him. But few knew him, for he was a precious young man, fit for God. You have cause to bless the Lord. He is a glorious saint in heaven, wherein you ought exceedingly to rejoice. Let this drink up your sorrow, seeing these are not feigned words to comfort you, but the thing is so real and undoubted a truth. You may do all things by the strength of Christ. Seek that, and you shall easily bear your trial. This is no sociopath. And if we can take this personal testimony, the letters he wrote to his daughter-in-law, because of his worries that his eldest surviving son, his third son, but the eldest surviving son, Richard, was not born again, hadn't, hadn't got a, he only had a second-hand, not a first-hand knowledge of God. And he writes to her, uh, telling her to keep her, get her prayer life to involve his son, to bring him into that relationship. Again, difficult to see uh, this deeply personal material. And there are lots of deeply personal letters to other close family and close family friends who would know whether he was being insincere or not. I'm going to have to jump a bit. It's crucial in understanding this religion, as I've already hinted from the from talk about prayer meetings, it's really important to recognise that Cromwell is deeply anti-clerical. What's interesting about him, which separates him from the people who occupy this pulpit, is he doesn't believe that, um, that the breaking of the word, the, the introducing people to the meaning of the word, is the work of ordained ministers. If, the, if he disliked Catholics and Anglicans because they controlled access to the, to the sacraments, only a priest could give you communion, only a priest could celebrate the Mass or the Holy Communion. He, didn't, he deeply, deeply deplored the idea that uh, to have a true understanding of the meaning of Scripture, uh, you needed to be ordained. Now, the extreme example of this is what he says to the Irish clergy in December 1649. Your covenant, he's addressing it to the Catholic clergy, your covenant, if you understood it, is with death and hell. Your union is with Simeon and Levi. Associate yourselves and it shall be broken in pieces. Take counsel together and it shall come to naught. For although it becomes us to be humble in respect of ourselves, yet we can say to you, God is not with you. So he's quoting there Isaiah 28. He's, uh, he's quoting Genesis 49. That's the story of Simeon and Levi, um, the sons of Joseph who were disinherited um, because they'd committed atrocities against a peaceful neighboring tribe. And then he goes back to Isaiah. In fact, Isaiah 8, the very verse he was to, he quoted two years earlier to Oliver St. John. So you might say, well, of course he's against the Catholic clergy. So here he is 12 months later talking to Presbyterian clergy in Scotland. I beseech you in the bowels of Christ to think it possible you might be mistaken. He doesn't ever apply it to himself. So here he was, the general commanding an undefeated army of godly Protestants, confronting an even larger undefeated army of, of, of Scottish Protestants. He'd done his thinking, and for them as well as for himself. I pre, pray you read the 28th of Isaiah from the 5th to the 15th verse. Now they would have known what a stinging rebuke that was. For the passage describes how Jewish priests, drunk with strong wine, vomited over the altar of the Lord. There is, Cromwell rammed home his elusive message, a spiritual fullness that can, that world may call drunkenness, a carnal confidence upon misunderstood and misapplied precepts, which may be called spiritual drunkenness. And to ram it home even further, repeating what he'd hurled at the Catholic clergy earlier in the year, he said, 
there may be a covenant with death and hell. I will not say yours is so, but judge if such things have a politic aim to avoid the overflowing scourge or to accomplish worldly interests. So the Irish clergy did have a covenant with death and hell. The Scottish Presbyterian may have a covenant with death and hell. But it, he, he think clergy who deny direct access to the scriptures are as bad as those who deny direct access to Holy Communion. And did you notice um, in the, um, the very opening passage from 1653, Cromwell says, did you notice, I speak not for that ministry which hath derived itself through the papistry, but for those who have received the gifts of the Spirit. So anyone who derives their notion of holy orders by a diluted form of Catholicism are to be distrusted. Hence he does believe in free worship, free assembly, free praying. That's not incompatible with what some of the independent churches were doing. But the independent churches still preferred to have a monopoly on preaching. And I don't think he would, would tolerate that. So now I've got to, I've got to push on. Um, I've got ten minutes really. So I was going to take you through some of the most powerful ways in which he engages with scripture and, and explains to people how his encounter with scriptures is determining his freedom of action. It, it empowers him to do things and it limits him. There are times when what the scriptures tell him um, so that he should be doing something and the times when scriptures tell him to hold back. He's waiting for the sign. And until he gets the sign, he cannot act. So it both empowers and restrains him. And what fascinates me is this is not, that you don't ever feel with him that it's special pleading. You know, he's just finding scripture to support him. It's very inconvenient not to become king in 1657. Um, I'm trying to think of another one here that I can choose from the ones I've got. Now, I'm going to pass over them because I want to say something more important. What's implied by what, lots of what I've said is that Cromwell believes passionately in liberty. He believes that England was suffering, was in a state of slavery. And, uh, uh, and uh, kings who took away their, their, their protections at law and kings who not only permitted but encouraged false religion and he wanted to liberate them. But not to put them in an alternative straitjacket, but to liberate them to be free. He speaks frequently of the various forms of godliness in this nation. He talks about freedom of forms. I'm a man not wedded and glued to forms of government. I, uh, uh, forms of government are dross and dung in comparison of Christ. That's St. Paul. So forms of government, both in church and state, are not fixed. They're whatever God thinks is right for this nation at this time. But you have to free people in the corrupt... With the world it is, all forms are subject to corruption. So he's trying to create a context in which everyone who has certain basic things in place should be allowed to explore their part of the truth in the hope of building up a bigger mosaic of truth from what all of them can contribute. Now, he doesn't ever justify this, but he does think in order to be in an, an authentic search for truth, you must believe in the Trinity. Uh, he will not allow anti-Trinitarians to preach. But he doesn't persecute them. He simply, um, well, he does persecute in the sense that he, 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 he gives them pensions and makes them live uh, in the Silly Isles or the Isle of Wight or somewhere they can't do much harm. He believes you must accept the principle that all things necessary to salvation to be found in Scripture. If you deny the authority of Scripture then you cannot be free 
to preach. But he doesn't say you can't be free to meet. For Cromwell, it is very important that he thinks everybody has the right of religious assembly, but only those who subscribe to these two basic rules, you accept the Trinity and you accept the authority of Scripture, only they can preach and evangelize. Why is it, that, why is it no surprise then that he welcomes the Jews back into England after 300 years? Because one thing you'll be sure of with Jews in the 17th century, as in most centuries, they aren't going to evangelize. They're simply going to do their own thing. So they're welcome. He gives them synagogues. He gives them burial grounds. He encourages them. And Cromwell believes not only in religious um, uh, liberty, but religious equality. No one else before the 19th century believes everybody should be equally um, politically free. Until the 19th century, Great Toleration Act 1689, yes, but are those who are not members of the Church of England allowed to, uh, allowed to sit in Parliament? No. Can they be magistrates? No. Can they be lawyers? No. For Cromwell, yes. All laws requiring people to, be, to, to participate in the state church are removed. The, everyone is free to worship as they wish. The only restriction is you cannot evangelize if you don't subscribe to his basic tenets. So here he is in 1655 talking about religious freedom. Are these things done, or anything towards them? Is there not yet upon the spirits of men a strange itch? Nothing will satisfy them unless they can put their finger upon their brethren's consciences to pinch them there. To do so, this was no part of the contest we had with the common adversary. For religious freedom was not the thing at first contested for. But God brought it to that issue at last and gave it to us by way of redundancy. And at last it proved to be what was most dear to us. And wherein consisted this, more than obtaining that liberty from the tyranny of the bishops to all species of Protestants, to worship God according to their own light and consciences. For want of which many of our brethren forsook their native countries to seek their bread from strangers to live in howling wildernesses and for which also many that remained here were imprisoned and otherwise abused and made the scorn of the nation. Now, to seek their bread with some strangers and to live in howling wildernesses, of course, is a, is a reference to New England. And next month, Joel Halcombe's going to talk about that experience. So that's an absolute link into what he's going to talk about. Is, the, is it ingenuous to ask for liberty and not to give it? What greater hypocrisy than for those who are oppressed by the bishops to become the greatest oppressors themselves so soon as their yoke was removed? I could wish that they who call for liberty now also had not too much of that spirit if the power were in their hands. You either believe him or you don't, but that is the passion of his life. To make men free and then to find ways of educating them to accept the responsibilities of liberty. Because if they didn't accept the responsibility of liberty, their liberty would lead them to track back to Egypt. And at the end of his life, I think he felt it all gone wrong. This is the last speech he makes. You hear the exhaustion the feeling of failure. The people of England had not accepted the responsibilities of liberty. It is not only that we have an appetite for variety, to be not, o not only making wounds, but as if we would see one making wounds in a man's side and rending, and would desire nothing more than to be groping and groveling with fingers in those wounds. This is what men would be at. This is the spirit of those who would trample upon men's liberties in spiritual respects. They would be making wounds and rending and tearing and making them wider than they are. Is not this the case? 
does there want anything? I speak not of the sects in an ill sense, but the nation is hugely made up of them. And what is the want that these things are not done to the utmost, but that men have more anger than strength? They have more power, they have not power to attain their end. And I beseech you, judge, what such a company of men of these sorts are doing while they're contesting one with another. They're contesting in the midst of a generation of men, a malignant in the Episcopal party, contesting in the midst of all those united. What must be the office issue of such a thing? It is so. Uh, this exhaustion that all his pleading, all his, all his work to create liberty, and it was just being abused. Right, I, I really am running over now, so um, I'm just going to have to be desperately short. And if you want to ask me about Ireland, I, I will talk about it properly. Cromwell says, and um, I'll go to the very end. Cromwell says, um, to the Irish Catholics, um, here we are. He says, as for the people, what thoughts they have in matters of religion in their own breasts I cannot reach. But think it my duty if they walk honestly and peaceably not to cause them in the least to suffer for the same, but I shall endeavour to walk patiently in love towards them, to see if at any time it shall please God to give them another or a better mind. And all men under the power of England within this dominion are required and enjoined strictly and religious to do the same. Um, he's going to silence Catholic priests who are preaching hatred, who are preaching rebellion, who are preaching massacre. But he's going to allow he's not going to force Catholics to attend Protestant worship. He's not going to prevent them worshipping on their own any more than he does with English Catholics. And in Maryland, which is a Catholic colony which was taken over by Protestant New Englanders, he sent a naval fleet to reinstate the Catholic Lord Proprietor because those Catholics in Maryland lived in peace with their Protestant neighbours until their Protestant neighbours seized power. So he is consistent, but he's consistent in an anti-clerical way. He blames the Catholic clergy for the massacres of 1641-2 to in which 12,000 Protestants have been killed by Catholics. And he blamed the priests for organising those massacres. So he certainly has no time for Catholic priests. It doesn't mean to say he's going to persecute. He believes radically that persecution is counterproductive. That if you persecute you will cr and make martyrs, the martyrs will inspire others to take their place. It's the problem we have with radical Islam. The more martyrs we make, the more recruits they gain. It's the same dilemma. There isn't a, there isn't a simple answer. But we need to recognise that. How do you get at the radicals without radicalising the moderates? And Cromwell's answer is, you live with it, you do not persecute. Is that a Christian virtue or not? So, more on that if you'd like, because I was going to talk for ten minutes on it, and you've only got two, you've only had two. He lives with the dilemmas of faith. I learnt a lot about Cromwell by sitting at a dinner at the end of his life next to Ian Paisley. And Ian Paisley told me that for him, for most of his life, God had told him to, that the way to protect the uh, Protestant and uh, English interest in the north of Ireland was to preach against popery. But God had told him as he studied his Bible in the words of Ecclesiastes to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. And that ends four verses on. A time to love and a time to hate. 
a time for war and a time for peace. And Ian Paisley said to me, I read that for the umpteenth time, and God told me it was a time for peace. If you've ever wondered what happened, what made it possible for Paisley to share power with the IRA, it's Ecclesiastes. And I learned then that's exactly how Cromwell was. There isn't a consistency other than a consistency with God's advice. And when God told him it's time to change, there's no inconsistency. Because you'll still do what you've always done. You've been listening to God. But of course Cromwell always had to have people around him uh, to, to work with him. And when God told him to change, he dumped all the people who he'd been saying in this charismatic way, you are the people who can bring us true liberty. Then he said, no, 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 we've got it all wrong. He says to one group of ministers, you know, I'll tell you a tale of my weakness and folly. We've got it completely wrong. We've got to do it another way. And they say, but we're not doing it our way anymore. He said, no, no, go off. I'm, yeah, I'm, you're all sacked. So, of course, they all feel betrayed. And over time, he betrays loads of people who cannot journey with him through his personal encounter of a God who had raised him up beyond what he wanted, beyond what he, what he wished. And that's why they all say, he was a hypocrite because they didn't understand or they couldn't accept that when their cherished way of making the revolution work was, was rejected because it failed um, that, he ha that he hadn't used them so that's how I square the circle and why I think that as a Catholic I think I have a huge amount to learn from him because he was play, was came from a lowly background in a small house in Huntingdon to be the supreme governor of these islands had to do ruthless things had to do he had his Hiroshima moment and his Nagasaki moment in Drogheda and Wexford and he, he lived out a life uh, where he attempted to answer call from God and then to do everything he could to create a new kind of liberty which the world hadn't seen and of course he was human and of course he failed but the heroism of the attempt is worthy of our attention Thank you. Of course, absolutely. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. 70% um, of all, all recognisable quotations are from the Old Testament, 30% are from the New Testament, almost all of them from the Epistles. The, 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 really no, the really notable absences is virtually nothing from the Gospels, virtually nothing from the Book of Revelation, not much from the Book of Daniel. So Psalms... The, 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 the different times in his life, you know, the books of Moses or, the, or Isaiah, you must have been there, so Isaiah is terribly important. Some of the other prophets, but particularly Isaiah. I mean, I'd have thought that, uh, that getting on for half his, or all his Bible quotations would be from um, the five books of Moses, from Isaiah, from the Psalms, and from the Pauline epistles. Um, well, probably more than that, sorry, more than that. Um, 30 Years' War, um, I mean, clearly, um, he, doesn't ever, he doesn't ever talk about the 30 Years' War as being a global struggle between Christ and Antichrist. 
He does talk about it much more as a, a war uh, between Protestant and Catholic rulers, but he doesn't heighten the rhetoric. Now, in 1641 and 1642, that there is an um, uprising, uprising in Ireland in which 12,000 Protestants are massacred. 8,000 8, survivors swear depositions of what, ha of what they knew to have happened. All these depositions survive, and they've recently been put online. You can see them if you want, 1641.tcd.ie. And you can, if you've got any Irish background, you can see whether your ancestors were, uh, were involved. Um, but um, they're in three parts. The first is, in, is the insurance claim, which has all the veracity of any insurance claim. The second is eyewitness testimony because that could be used in court even if you disappeared. The third was hearsay, which is not admissible in the common law. You needed the hearsay because it might well anecdotally draw your attention to other people you could investigate. So the depositions are very carefully distinguished between those three types. Now, the, in it, there, there are incredibly populist pamphlets published in England which draw on these depositions, but they draw overwhelmingly on the hearsay. And it's in the hearsay that you get the stories of atrocity, the stories of torture, of sexual violence, um, of slow, uh, slow agonising death. The eyewitness statements are all about intimidation, of letting, if people, if people don't resist you, of taking everything from them and driving them out into the winter cold where many of them died of, of, of privation. All the violence in the eyewitness is when there is resistance and then people are clubbed or shot or stabbed. But that is not reported. Cromwell gets, gets the only source of information he's got are those pamphlets. And the hearsay comes straight from the Thirty Years' War atrocity literature and to some extent from Fox's Book of Martyrs but for the Thirty Years War we know that specifically because one of the most popular pamphlets has woodcuts showing atrocity those are straightforwardly brought in from Germany so one there's one which appears to show um, a town uh, a, a town under siege it's Magdeburg there's no city like that in, in the parts of Ireland affected by the, by the uprising. So I think he clearly is adversely affected at second hand. At first hand, he never refers particularly to what happens on the continent. Um, his foreign policy is perfectly happy to make deals with Catholic, Catholic kings and Catholic countries. I mean, he does recognise Spain as being the great enemy, but he looks back you know, to the history of Spain, to the Marian burnings, the Armada, the gunpowder plot, the fact that Spain was your natural enemy. But it doesn't mean he won't make a deal with the French, who are uh, also a Catholic monarchy, or for that matter with the Austrians. So uh, th I think that's, that's, a, that's a fairly reduced answer, but that, that's, that's one. Who's, ne who's next? Yes? Very, very little. Very, very little. I mean, it's, uh, we, know, we know nothing really before. We know that when he was 16, he went, goes to Cambridge. We know, we know something about he went to school, and we know who his schoolmaster was. We can work out what sort of education he had. At 16, he goes to Cambridge. He's there for a year. His, his known associates are not particularly Puritan. His tutor wasn't particularly Puritan. He then leaves because his father dies. And so at the age of 17, he has to go home to his, to his mother with eight other children and has to start sort of helping her to run the family business, for want of a better word. And by the, he marries in um, 1621, so only 22, a marriage almost certainly arranged by his father's sister, 
who was married to a prominent Essex Puritan, who is certainly seated as her job in life to place all her wider family into, Protest into Puritan circles. Uh, Lady Joan Barrington. Um, and he marries the daughter of a London merchant, uh, again, not especially Puritan, but with um, the Puritan connections. I mean, London merchants tended to be, you know, uh, firmly Protestant. Um, and we know that he, uh, there are annual elections for the, for the council in Huntington. It's a fairly broad franchise. And in most years, in the 1620s, he's made a councilman in a very small borough. And then at the end of the 1620s, a new charter comes in, which gets rid of the democratic element and, because, and create efficient government by having an appointed long-term council that will simply recruit to itself, and Cromwell's left out of that. That's around the time of his breakdown. Um, but uh, uh, that's about it. Beyond that, we li literally, the, the, you know, all attempts to kind of penetrate the, the silence um, have gone. There are very small th there are things I could say about his time at Cambridge and about his relationship with his old college, but they're, they're pretty tentative. Else? Yes. Well, yes. Very yes. Yes. Well, yes, it is, it's true. I think according to the laws of war, he, he didn't break the laws of war. But those laws of war weren't, weren't operative in England. I mean, in other words, the, the, the English of war had been a lot more civil uh, than that. There weren't any massacres in England. I mean, the, Rupert, the, Rupert runs a mock in, in Bolton and in um, Leicester, and a couple of hundred people get killed. I mean, there are probably a hundred killed when he storms Basing House. But there's not 3,000, and the man who buried them tells there are 3,552 people killed at Jofferda. The garrison is 3,100, because Cromwell enumerates it. We know that several hundred were sent uh, as indentured servants, that's say slaves, to the Barbados. So we think that the, I think at any rate, I mean there are as many views on this as there are historians, but I, I'm absolutely convinced I'm right, to be honest. I think there are probably 800 civilians killed. Um, what we need to distinguish is that when an army is storming through a town, um, they don't stop and ask people in, in dresses whether they're men in disguise. I mean, you just kill everybody who gets in your way. I think there were significant civilian casualties in what modern um, um, war would call collateral damage. There is no evidence that the several hundred killed in cold blood uh, were civilians. They, they were combatants who'd locked themselves in churches. They'd locked themselves in medieval turrets. Now, some of that Cromwell writes about in a way that's quite chilling. He talks about somebody on the top of the church tower when he put all the pews at the bottom of the church tower and set fire to them, so they're smoking them out. And as they're dying from the heat and from the smoke, somebody jumps from the church tower, and Cromwell reports that as he came down, he screamed, God damn me, God confound me, I burn, I burn. Now, you can't hear somebody jumping off a tower. And I don't think, actually, if you, if you said, God damn me, God confound me, I burn, I burn, they'd have been dead, you know, halfway through. Of course, God damn me, God condem uh, confound me. I mean, this is a prediction of their, their, where they're going. It's not simply a statement of their, their dying. It's a, it's a prediction of eternal damnation. That's a very unpleasant moment. But what he says is, it's a righteous judgment upon those barbarous wretches to embrood their hands in so much innocent blood. Okay, so it's a revenge for the massacres of ten years before. And to prevent the effusion of blood for the future. Which are the just grounds for, for actions which must otherwise be regretted? It's Hiroshima. You know, he says very clearly, surrender and I'll give you generous terms. Refuse to surrender and you're at my mercy. If, if he, when he, when he, when he honours generous terms and when he kills the population of Drogheda, uh, 
People know he means it. It makes you much more likely to accept generous terms. Now, if we forget about the, 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 the consequence of the Drogheda down to the present, if we think ter- simply in terms of him winning a very, very difficult um, uh, campaign in Ireland against very large numbers with a p- flaky parliament that's getting a lot of gr- people gr- being, being very grudging to pay the money, how do, I mean, a you know, vast amount of taxation to fund him, how long is that will going to carry on? He's got to do it quickly. He got 180 towns to take with fortifications. So Drogheda is, is, uh, is um, um, Hiroshima and Wexford is Nagasaki, and it works. You know, other people hold him up, but as soon as they know that they're running out of defence, they surrender. Of course, the longer they leave it, the less generous the terms, but, you know, they surrender. And when he makes his one failure, which is to storm Clonmel, uh, and loses 2,000 men in a, in a failed storm through a breach in the walls, he offers them generous terms, and despite his soldiers' desire for revenge, he forces the uh, terms to be observed. It would, be, it would have been catastrophic for him if there had been an atrocity after people had surrendered on terms. So that's the defence of him. It doesn't make it... You still have to be very squeamish about it. And there are elements in his letter which, which, which don't read well, like the fact that the, um, those, the soldiers who surrender, um, the officers are killed, and the rank and file line up, and every tenth man is executed, and the others are sent to slaves. And the people who execute the tenth man are the ones who are reprieved by clubbing them to death. You know to waste bullets. And if you if you club your friend to death, it doesn't do much for your self-esteem. It doesn't do much for your desire to get back into action. It's Roman, of course. It's the Roman system. Is that is that sufficient? Okay. Perhaps I have a final question. Yeah. After listening to you, someone who's made and never really studied from her at all, and someone who's made go away from me wanting to learn more. I've got many, many books. Um, could you just recommend one or two, yeah. but maybe not the most academic, that no. would help us to understand those If you can... Um, uh, the, the, it, isn't com- it is complicated. For example, Christopher Hills is a great book, but it's not a very good first book. Um, the little book in the series called Very Interesting People, VIP, uh, which I did for Cromwell, it isn't a bad start and has been recently praised as such. There's a new book um, published by Penguin by somebody called David Horsepool uh, in a little series um, um, of English monarchs and they, they rather controversially include Cromwell. And that's not a bad introduction. Um, there's one by um, Barry Coward, a wonderful man who was a professor in London and a great teacher, um, called Oliver Cromwell. I think those probably... And the, if you want a big one, although it's, although it's showing its age, uh, it, uh, if you want a really big bulky read, the Antonia Fraser biography from the 1960s is, is well-researched and is good on, uh, as a, uh, on the, st- the storyline. Now, it's that book I'm trying to replace by the one I'm going to write, but I'm, I'm sure you don't want to wait for me to finish that. I should be over 75. And, uh, um, I, uh, they, they, I got a quite a big advance, so um, <laughs> Bloomsbury are on my tail all the time. Will I update them? And I said, as soon as, the, as soon as the edition has gone to press, I will sit down and write it. But it's, you know, we're 99% done, and it's just the last checking that's taking forever. Because everybody else has moved on, there are other projects, and getting them to do that last bit of checking is proving, including me. Okay. Right.